Before we get going today, I will just introduce our first speaker, Richard Mueller, who is a university economics professor. He knows what's happening in the world, pretty much, in terms of economics. And uh, he's going to be the first presenter, and Yale Belanger is going to follow. So without further ado, Please give Richard a warm welcome. Just that. So what we're talking about, this, this is out of, basically out of the chapter that, that I wrote for the book, and Yale's going to talk about the chapter that, that, that he wrote. Uh, I've updated some of the slides a little bit, of course, because we have some more uh, um, you know, contemporary information that I sort of wanted to, to make sure was, was in there. So um, does anybody remember this? Alberta's calling, but will anybody answer, right? Last August, Jason Kenney, he started this campaign about sort of trying to attract people to uh, Alberta. And um, he you know, was flanked by all these wonderful posters there to say all the great things about living in Alberta. And this was mainly targeted to people in Vancouver and Toronto at that time anyway. And then unbeknownst to the poor citizens of Toronto, a week later, he and a couple cabinet ministers showed up in the subway in Toronto. So this is how a bunch of Torontonians met their, uh, uh, started their morning commute, I suppose, with, uh, with uh, Alberta's calling. And so the whole idea was just to, again, at the program was, let's, let's you know, bring some people here, we'll tell them it's low cost of living here, jobs, 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 all those economics kind of uh, things. You know, a little bit about the quality of life out here. Um, and so we have part two of this now. Now that we have uh, Brian Jean, who's the minister responsible for this portfolio, he was up in Canmore last month uh, touting the same sort of Alberta's Calling program, but this time for people, uh, broaden the program basically, all over Ontario as well as the Maritimes. So I guess we didn't get enough people interested from Vancouver and Toronto, so we had to sort of, sort of uh, cast a wider net uh, in this program here. So does this sound familiar? You remember this guy? You remember the mid-1990s, and this is why the, the title of the chapter has Redux in it, because we're really revisiting something we did in the past. And what happened in the past, of course, in the 1990s, was there was, you know, big, you know, the client cuts, as we called them at the time, big cutbacks, right? A lot of people, a lot of public servants, you know, uh, left the province, nurses, doctors, teachers, professors, you name it, left the province. A lot went to the United States. And, of course, we had this big uh, national kind of panic attack about a brain drain. We're losing all our best and brightest at the time. Well, the same thing is sort of starting to, to occur here. And I'm trying to read the tea leaves a little bit as you'll see uh, sort of what's going on now, what we might expect in terms of migration in and out of Alberta in the, in the future and even amongst our young, especially amongst our young people. So that's what we're really, I'm really concerned about anyway, losing that young talent. And I'll talk about that a bit here. So I, I, what I have to do, because we're you know, an academic, we've got to talk about some of the theory here. So this is a, a book uh, from Harry Hiller, who's a retired sociologist up at the University of Calgary. And he sort of talks about migration being sort of this process, right? So sort of unlike what Kenny and his ilk are trying to sort of push about all these great economic things, it's got a lot to do with uh, you know, dissatisfaction, um, you know, being, um, uh, feeling alienated in the place you live, and sort of thinking the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And it really has not a lot to do, it does have something to do with moving for work. I mean, people aren't going to move to depressed areas uh, if, if the jobs aren't available for them. But moving for work really sort of simplifies this complex uh, process. Okay. And we have to think about that maybe there are young people being sort of disenfranchised, disenchanted with the current political situation, and therefore they are leaving the province, A, and B, we're not going to be attracting as many young people, simply because the feeling is that the government of Alberta and maybe a lot of you know, Alberta's people don't share sort of the same values that a lot of these young people uh, currently might have. And so this is sort of a, as I say in the, the bottom bullet here, this, this argument is kind of symmetric, right? We might be actually attracting people because of the current government and the sort of the social state of affairs in this province. At the same time, we're repelling people. So um, it's, and we're going to see in a minute, it's pretty hard to figure the, to differentiate the two. So studying migration is really complex, right? And, and, and I have sort of ongoing work in this. So this is very, for, for the book purposes, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a good chapter, and, but it's very preliminary, right? When, once the data come out, I'll be able to do more work on this. And so the problem with studying migration is that there's so many things that are behind it, right? It's really kind of a rare thing that people actually leave where they, they're from. It doesn't happen very often, and that's actually decreased 
increasing too over time, the number of people leaving or the proportion of people leaving their provinces. Only when we get something like a really huge shock, like when we had the Parti Quebecois voted in in Quebec in 1976, was it 77? Yeah. Mid-70s. Anyway, at war, uh, another thing was a big shock, of course, was the close, and I just heard this on the radio on the way in, was the closing of the fisheries in Newfoundland back in the early 1990s, right? These are huge shocks, and so we can kind of track migration based on that huge shock. But cur the current data are basically lacking, and so what we want to do is sort of look at the intentions of people. Uh, and see exactly, sort of, that's sort of reading the tea leaves, right? If people become disenchanted today, they're more likely to leave tomorrow, is what it comes down to. So we're looking for that disenchantment today before these hard numbers come up. But first, of course, we've got to show some numbers here. And these uh, numbers here, if you look at sort of the line on the top, that's uh, in migration to Alberta. Uh, the, the orange on my screen, anyway, the middle line is out migration, and the bottom purple line is net migration. Okay, so this goes all the way back to, excuse me, 2000? The year 2000? <laughs> Everybody laughs. I get the crowd. Yeah, okay. I'm reading the room right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, the purple line at the bottom is the net migration there, and you sort of, so it's just, sort of see the ebbs and flows ever since 2000. And what you see, oh, I think I put a circle around there, there we go, to draw your attention to that. Uh, this sort of big spike, Th these data only go up to the last quarter of last year, and again, we're trying to talk about something contemporary, so this is kind of frustrating, some of the data are even older than that. Um, but sort of see this big spike here, and this is about the same time the Alberta's Calling campaign was kind of rolled out, right? And uh, you know, ever since then, they've been sort of touting, Brian Jean's been touting all these people coming to Alberta, and what he points out is, the, is it points to is the sort of big uh, bump there uh, in the middle of that kind of oval, which was a couple quarters ago, and it's sort of since fallen off since then. But again, we don't really have appropriate data to, to say anything definitive at this point, but I'll still try to convince you otherwise. This is right out of the book, a table right out of the book. This is, looks at the net, net interprovincial migration as a percentage of the population. And you know, the, the different colored lines are for different age groups, basically. So we sort of see all this, I mean, Alberta, if you compare this with other provinces, our in-migration and out-migration patterns are so volatile, it's just almost comical uh, how, how much variation there is. We have these huge ebbs and flows throughout history. But you sort of see that little uptick at the end, right? Looks good. Oh, I think I circled that too. There we go. Um, so this little uptick, and, and, and uh, actually these data only go until June. 30th last year, so these are fairly old, but there's a little bit uptick. So things, you know, below the line there, uh, the, the, the solid um, black line, were negative for a while. You know, we went through some tough times and, and people weren't uh, doing so well, et cetera, so they left the province. And now we sort of see this uptick, which looks kind of uh, optimistic. And if we look at this group here, just in terms of in migration, we see this big uptick again, uh, at least at the beginning of last year, which is, looks good. And of course, the, the government has been, been touting these numbers and saying, this is great. All these people are coming into Alberta. You know, things are looking good. The Alberta advantage, you know all the buzzwords. Um, what they don't tell you is this. There's also an uptick in the number of people leaving the province, right? And those are the people we're sort of really concerned with here. And so what we're going to take a look at is young people are leaving, right? Uh, and these are some things other commentators have said on this. Janet Lane said we've got a bit of an early warning here that this could be a longer term problem. Uh, David Finch up at Mount Royal said decisions are being made that are draining the talent out of the province or on the flip side, not attracting talent to the province. So people are quite aware of these things, even if the data that we have right now are not sort of reflecting uh, what's sort of going on in people's minds. And again, this is migration as a process, and so this might just be the beginning, this disenchantment. So we want to listen to what people are saying. Uh, we have some problems with education. Uh, there was an op-ed in the Edmonton Journal last month, I think, talked the presidency of uh, University of Alberta and University of Calgary wrote that the government is not providing enough PSE spaces for young people, and this is contributing to the exodus. So we really don't, we, Alberta has a really relatively poor record of, uh, of young people attending post-secondary education uh, for various reasons, one being, of course, the uh, attraction of the oil and gas sector. And anyway, second bullet, Alberta is now a net exporter of undergraduate students. A few years ago, we used to be a net importer. We had extra space in our universities to, 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 uh, to educate young people. We don't have that uh, anymore. We're actually exporting people. And certainly, a lot of these people are never going to return again. They leave. They're not going to return. They put down roots, right? We know that's how migration works or doesn't work. And so a lot of this might have to do, and the government has been changing this, as you probably heard, putting more spots in what they consider to be important uh, uh, fields of study in post-secondary education institutions, right? So they're putting money into nursing, aviation, uh, computer science, finance, those types of areas. Whether or not there's enough money flowing in and enough spots are being created to, to reverse this potential uh, flow out of the province remains to be seen.
So politics plays a big role in migration. Again, we said migration is a fairly complex process, and it is, but politics play a big role too. So last, uh, maybe two years ago now, people were, uh, one of the reporters, I think it was Janet French from the CBC, sort of put out feelers on Reddit, I think, and said, okay, why did you move to BC? They are asking Albertans why they moved to BC. And I cut out a lot of the comments that maybe weren't fit for public consumption here, uh, but this is sort of, this sort of, uh, um, uh, um, exemplifies the basic tone of what people were saying. What did they say? It wasn't a government I was keen to live under, right? There's only so many times you can be told you're unwanted before you finally believe it. This is especially problematic amongst a lot of public servants, right? Being, um, not feeling like they were appreciated or, and respected. Um, this third one, somebody moved to BC in 1995. The reasons, Ralph Klein and snow. Alberta politics, politics have moved even further to the right and the snow is still, winter still exists. Last one, of course, not, not all of us support the actions of the Alberta government or majority. Uh, it's kind of why you see a lot fleeing, and that certainly seems to be the case. And this is especially problematic, again, at, at, at with young people. And part of the problem is we have an image problem. We live here. We know it's not nearly as uh, socially conservative as, uh, as some people would have us believe, right? Uh, I suspect a lot of people in this room are not. Um, and certainly that's the case. If you look at sort of polls about um, how Albertans think about things and compare that to, to the way th they think about issues nationally, there's not really much difference. You know, that, that comes out through and through. And yet we sort of have this image uh, here that, in the, you know, that outside the province, particularly in the largest metropolitan areas, the image of Alberta is an unsophisticated hinterland lingers. And we don't do ourselves any favor and my favorite example, this is the Calgary Stampede, right? We promote it. We don't sit there and, you know, and I, I swear to God, you go out to Ontario and many, most of you have probably been out there. If you talk to people, a lot of them, you know, swear that we all drive pickups and wear, wear boots and, and hats and, you know, we're ranchers and, and, you know, if we're not ranching, we're digging big dirty holes in the earth to extract the natural resources and yada, yada. So Alberta, again, the second bullet, it's certainly much more diverse than uh, a lot of people would would uh, give it credit for. And my favorite quote's the last one. Todd Hirsch used to be the uh, chief economist of Alberta ATB, I guess, until last year, I believe. He said, "Is Alberta being portrayed fairly or unfairly as nothing more than a dirty fossil fuel, than dirty fossil fuel spewing industries with socially conservative-minded people. And that's both a good thing if you want to attract that type of person, I suppose, uh, and maybe a bad thing if we're, we're repelling people that don't think the same way. So here we have from a couple weeks ago our marginalized position. I don't have to circle what I want you to look at, do I? <laughs> this made its way. It was a huge meme a couple weeks ago, right? I think every, everybody's probably seen this, I suspect, right? So let me uh, give uh, Yale some time since my time's up here. Anyway, just to sort of sum up, this is a very brief overview of the chapter in the book and some of the current work that I'm doing. But basically, young people are leaving and not being replaced, at least not like in the past, right? We've always had this huge churning of the population uh, in Alberta. Lots of people leaving, lots of people coming. But, you know, we would expect that, that more people would be coming today than leaving, and they are, but not maybe in the same numbers as they were before. And a lot of this might have to do with the politics and the grumblings about the political situation. And that is going to manifest itself young people day, today complaining is going to manifest itself and actually people physically leaving uh, sometime down the road. Uh, third bullet, would the uptick in net, net migration to Alberta be larger in the absence of the UCP? Here's, here's the you know, million dollar question. If the UCP didn't exist here, you know, they, would those numbers, in migration numbers, be much higher? I suspect they probably would be. Uh, but again, the counterfactual is a hard thing to try to, try to, try to deal with. Uh, cheap housing was one of the things they've been touting. That's only going to last so long, right? We, markets kind of tend to equalize. We got record numbers of immigration as opposed to in, in migrants or interprovincial migration uh, in, in the next couple of years coming in. Uh, and we have a housing problem to begin with. Uh, how are we going to house all these other people? Uh, certainly, the um, uh, house, cheap housing is not going to last, right? We're going to expect the prices to equalize over time. They're already coming down in Toronto and Vancouver. And they're going, well, unless except last month, they're going up here. Uh, young people need reasons to stay in and come to Alberta. There's, uh, um, you know, more than just jobs to people's lives, and especially young people. If you look at them, they're, not, they're more into work life balance than people your generation, our generation, ever were, okay? Um, uh, cheap, and my point here is, is it's cheaper to retain talent than to recruit it. If you go to universities or any kind of organization, they'll, that's worth their salt, basically, they'll talk about how expensive it is to attract people uh, compared to, to trying to retain people. And, you know, rather than going and talk about Alberta's calling, why aren't we maybe doing something internally here in Alberta to keep these young people or, or to stop their grumblings or to change their perceptions of what it means to live and work in Alberta. And then, I, horror of horrors, the last bullet, what if the UCP is re-elected? 
I, and again, I, I, there's some people in this room I talk to frequently, and every time there's a change in government to the people's dislike, and there's a lot of grumbling, yeah, I believe in the province. Just like every time there's a conservative, you know, Republican government uh, voted in the U.S. the last 20 years, Americans are saying, I'm going to Canada, you know, like it's just, okay, yeah, come on in, sure. Um, and that always happens, the grumbling. So whether these actually manifest into actual physical migration with nobody returning, that remains to be seen. So I will leave it there and let Yale have uh, his time. Thank you. Please welcome uh, Yale Belanger, who is a political science professor at the university. He also knows a lot about homelessness and and addiction, so, but that's not what he's talking about today. That doesn't mean you can't ask a question about that after all. Uh -oh. <laughs> Please welcome Yale. There we go, perfect. All right, I'll just hit my little timer so I don't go past 15 minutes here, because it's, it's very easy to do. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Um, every time I see Canute, he invites me to come and speak, but then I suspect he invites everybody in here to come and speak at one point or another. So we've never been able to reconnect. So it's been about 10 years, but it's, it's fantastic to, to be back. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the UCP's Indigenous policies. Uh, the chapter that I wrote with David Newhouse, who's been the director of the uh, uh, School of Indigenous Studies at Trent University for the uh, past 32 years, and he was my PhD supervisor, so we've still, uh, we've had a chance to maintain a relationship and do a lot of work over the years. He's from Ashwikan, Six Nations and First Nation, or in uh, Haudenosaunee ter territory, and uh, we've had a, a really good opportunity to talk about these ideas over the years. Um, the one thing that uh, we immediately spoke about after getting the invite from Trevor and Ricardo to participate um, was how to turn this into more than just simply a dialogue on, on colonization or colonialism. Um, we, we tend to find that the um, analyses are a little reductive at this point in terms of, well, it's all colonization that has led to bad relationships between provincial governments and between indigenous peoples. Uh, so ultimately, we just stop there. We, we take a look at the policy outcomes and we just uh, ascribe those to uh, colonialism. But if colonialism is everywhere, then it's nowhere and really it, it, it falls apart after a while. So what we wanted to do was take a look at how Jason Kenney was interpreting the ideas. So this paper is almost just um, a, a methodological approach to how we want to get a sense of uh, how he sees the world, the world according to Kenney in many ways, and how he's interpreting that world and turning it into uh, the UCP's indigenous policies. So when I say UCP and when I say Jason Kenney, they're all the same thing at this point because he's the ringleader, he is the voice, he's the ideological anchor in many ways. So who is Jason Kenney? Well, I'm not going to get into a, a whole background, but what I do want to do is uh, you know, s uh, talk about a little bit of his background when he was in Ottawa. And it's very simple in many ways. Um, he never really held any post or any ministerial appointment. He never had any control over a portfolio that dealt with indigenous issues in any way. Now, as you'll see in the next slide, that's a really big issue when we factor in the, I guess, uh, institutional complexity of what indigenous policy means to Canada from uh, federal and from provincial, and as we're seeing increasingly, municipal politics. Um, so over the years, he has had an opportunity to sit in, very ma in, in a number of different impor important uh, ministerial uh, posts. Uh, he was uh, uh, obviously Stephen Harper's watchdog for a while, his bulldog in session. He was almost a whip in many ways. He was a coordinating element. Um, but he really didn't play that big a role in anything that had to do with indigenous policy. So what we did, David and I, is we went and took a look at a bunch of newspaper reports over the last 15 or 20 years just to try and get a lay of the land. Uh, and then we took a look specifically at what the UCP had promoted prior to the election in terms of how it was going to deal with indigenous policy. And what we found were these main points here. They wanted to help indigenous students succeed. Uh, they sought to invest a billion dollars in loan guarantees for indigenous economic development. Uh, Ten million dollars was going to be assigned for litigants who wanted to sue the federal government uh, to have their aboriginal rights to develop affirmed. Uh, they wanted to alter, and I say that kindly, alter uh, K-4 curriculum, and ultimately they wanted to advocate that other First Nations in the province, even if they didn't want to, uh, start considering um, fossil fuel extraction and other sort of mineral and uh, forestry projects. So 
we've got a sense of where uh, Kenny wanted to go. Uh, but again, who is I got this little window popping up. Who is Jason Kenney? And what we did is we took a look at his last 25 years of uh, political performance in Ottawa primarily. And uh, here, one second. Okay. And we wanted to kind of get a sense of uh, wh where he's coming from, right? What, what's the lens that he's interpreting the world through? And, and ultimately, we came up with two different ways that he was looking at the world. And this is how he was starting to frame his indigenous policies prior to being elected, and most importantly, after being elected. Uh, first of all, he emphasized this idea of individual freedom. Uh, he wanted to ensure that private enterprise and especially rule of law uh, were going to dictate how he was going to start to devise these policies. And then on the second, uh, the, the, the second perspective is he wanted to also respect custom and tradition. Uh, he's a very strong federalist. He doesn't promote that, but he really does believe in uh, Ottawa having a very important role to play in Alberta politics, but that doesn't play well optically here in Alberta. So he had to pull back, and you'll see in a second how uh, he ultimately kind of rigged the system in a way to, to, to bypass some constitutional uh, pathways. Uh, and he also really believed that there was a specific way of looking at the world, a very Eurocentric way of looking at the world, or Canadian centric way um, that ultimately, through moral and legal sanctions on behavior, could ultimately be prescribed. It could lead people to believe and look at the world in a very specific way. In essence, what we're talking about here is there's a faith in rule and law and federalism in Canada, and that's very important from uh, our starting point. Now, when he entered in uh, to the premiership, he also entered into a very complex institutional world. And I'm not going to get into all of this, but these are just some of the considerations that any politician has to reflect upon um, when they start to engage in indigenous policymaking. Uh, there's issues of an aboriginal rights, uh, the inherent right to self-government and self-determination from domestic and international perspectives. Uh, there's federal legislation, laws are already in play that dictate how we can respond. The Supreme Court and the lower courts oftentimes speak to these issues quite authoritatively. Uh, treaties, other provincial indigenous agreements, and again, the international environment through the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. These are all issues that have to get factored in. This would be called the law and the convention and the traditions. These are issues that Jason Kenney um, knew he was going to have to contend with. Ultimately, he did not want to contend with a lot of these issues. And here is the conundrum that he faced. He is a law and order federalism believing individual. Indigenous issues are about law and order and about federalism. He did not want to engage with indigenous issues. So how did he ultimately bypass? Uh, uh, having to deal with a lot of these concerns. Ultimately, and this is what we wrote in the book, dis discounting these institutions outright is not possible for a party that heralds law and order as a conservative tradition. So what we found when we took a look at how he was doing things, and here's the second time around, it's the same slide once again. Well, what he found when uh, he came to the table is that Aboriginal rights are ensconced within the Constitution, and they're recognized and affirmed by the Supreme Court. He couldn't get around that. Self-government, self-determination, the same thing. The federal legislation, he couldn't change. He had to adhere and obey. Ultimately, the Supreme Court on a number of different occasions has identified uh, through the Daniels decision, uh, the duty to consult, and ultimately free prior and, and uh, informed consent, that the province has to ultimately obey a number of dictates that were going to undermine economic development potential. Treaties are in the Constitution under Section 35, meaning that uh, we, we really can't change them. We've got to adhere to them. Uh, those agreements that I talked about are legal, and then ultimately the international perspective here. What we found is that Jason Kenney, through his discourse in the media, through his rhetoric, attacked each one of these institutions from a variety of different perspectives. The point that we're trying to make is that each one of these institutions ultimately represented a threat to the UCB's Alberta First philosophy. And so what we're finding at this point is we're starting to analyze all the material is a very specific way of looking at the world. We didn't really know why he kept going back in time. Why didn't he talk about indigenous issues in a contemporary way? Why did he always talk about historic treaties? Why did he always um, invoke the name of uh, a John A. MacDonald, for example, you know, a guy who starved out indigenous populations to grow uh, the territories and to ultimately acquire sovereignty? Why was he so enamored with this individual? When we started to take a look back, what he was doing was employing this idea called originalism. And I'll just go through the points one at a time. From an originalist perspective, which is a conservative ideology, they don't believe in having, uh, 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 they don't believe in the need of uh, adjusting the Constitution. 
as it's written is how it shall be interpreted. And we saw Kenny frequently go back to the Constitution, specifically Section 91 and 92. We're not responsible for Indians and lands reserved for the Indians. Therefore, all we're going to do is interact. Um, indigenous people claims to treaty and aboriginal rights were not considered to be contemporary issues. Uh, they were not considered legally actionable. They were frozen in time. They were historic vestiges of a people who may exist right now, but nevertheless do not have those same rights. And ultimately, and this is from John Burroughs' uh, writing on this issue, um, it inhibits indigenous peoples from proving their contemporary rights, so on and so forth. The underlying piece is the most important element here because such claims do not have strong historical analogs at the moment of the European encounter. All he's saying is that because indigenous peoples didn't look like Europeans, ultimately they did not have the same economic, uh, social, and political institutions, or they were certainly not to be valued at the same level of European traditions and institutions. So you get a very clear idea of where he's coming from at this point how indigenous peoples once were compared to how he interpreted them living at this point in time were two different things. And he consistently reflected on who we were as a country 150 years ago as opposed to who we are as a province as of the year 2019. The next piece that we saw was that, and he would never admit this because he was invoking Pierre Trudeau. <laughs> he was embracing Pierre Trudeau's policy from 1969, the white paper policy. We've heard a lot about this. Here are the three key elements from a policy that was intended to assimilate Indians, quote unquote, into Canadian society. <laughs> Removing those legal distinctions to make them apparently equal. Dismantling the structures that kept Indians separate from Canadian society, reserves as an example. And then proposing to turn over all federal responsibility to the provinces. That's what he was seeking to achieve ultimately. Um, we took a look at the education policy and the economic policy. Uh, we can talk later in the, qu uh, the questions if you want and I can give you some more detail. But ultimately, this is where Jason Kenney's coming from. He's an originalist. He is embracing the white paper. He also believes in law and order, which means that he's in a real sticky position. How does the UCP move forward at this point in time without violating its principles? Now, my wife told me not to put that title up there, but I thought it worked. It really did. Kenny, the white originalist, the white paper and his originalism. The UCP used originalism to emphasize the division of powers. Now, this is a really important point. I don't want to get into too much detail. But what he's saying is that ultimately we can just back off of having to absorb any responsibility for indigenous issues in the province, which means at this moment in time, uh, we're going to negotiate with them. If they don't like what we're doing, too bad. If they don't like the fact that we're e ignoring the duty to consult, it's got nothing to do with us. Free prior consent. Treaties were rarely discussed as a result. Custom and rule of law. Indigenous self-government was ignored outright. Custom and rule of law. Uh, urban indigenous peoples were ignored entirely in the entire uh, discourse. Uh, indigenous rights were questioned, if not undermined, actively. And what I found really particularly distressing is that he was pitting energy versus non-energy uh, producing First Nations against one another. If you produced oil, that was fine. If you didn't want to do that, that's a self-determining act. But ultimately, the policies were devised in such a way to penalize those communities from de developing as they saw fit. The last piece, he put up $10 million in a litigation fund, um, which we argue sought to bypass the constitutional division of powers. He was very upset that uh, we couldn't build pipelines to salt water for the purposes of exporting our product. Um, he was not able to challenge that because ultimately the Canadian government under Section 91 has prerogative power to dictate national energy issues. What he was doing was providing money to indigenous communities for the purposes of suing the government on the province's behalf. It, technically brilliant, but morally ew, kind of problematic on a number of levels. So just to sum things up here, what we found was that the UCP it employed a very specific way of looking at the world, an originalist lens to create a policy that ultimately would allow it to bypass any sort of responsibility or any sort of, I guess, um, uh, recognition of indigenous uh, peoples across uh, throughout the province. It encouraged indigenous peoples to contribute to the economic revitalization of the province through uh, fossil fuels and it devised its policies to punish those that didn't follow accordingly. It denied self-determination and ultimately the goal was simply to safeguard Alberta's uh, ongoing uh, economic interests without really including indigenous peoples. So at the moment that he says we want to get rid of the rules that are creating separation, his very policies were implementing that very separation. We'll just stop here. 
because this is an institutional element of now the contemporary UCP policy that will come into play on uh, May 29th should they become the party in power. Daniel Smith is using the exact same talking points, which does not bode well for uh, the future of indigenous and uh, Alberta relations from this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill and Richard, for your thought-provoking presentation. Uh, before we get started on the question, uh, I just want to mention that SACPA memberships are available in the back somewhere. Lori Schultz is pretty happy to take your money, and there's also jars on the table where you can creep, contribute to our well-being. Um, you can also buy LSU memberships if you're that way inclined. Uh, we're very happy that we're able to use this facility for free. Uh, so by uh, purchasing <coughs> food and supporting the LSU, you're supporting SACPA as well. Uh, thank you to uh, the University of Lethbridge for their <coughs> financial contribution to SACPA. It comes straight out of Yale and Richard's wages. <laughs> <laughs> we paid, we paid to present. <laughs> and um, many thanks to Shaw TV, who's doing a stellar job of, of recording these sessions and putting them on YouTube and getting the word out to a bigger crowd. And also to Lethbridge Herald and uh, I don't see Lethbridge Hill today, but anyway, they will usually report on these sessions as well, and they may still by look, looking at it later. They're here. Uh, next week's topic is our Mayor Blaine Higgin, who is here today, and just to test, test out the waters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So that'll be very interesting, and that's on, on Thursday next week. We're back to Thursday next week. Uh, so without further ado, questions. Feel free to walk up along the wall and, and uh, get in the queue and ask questions to our speakers. How are you, buddy? Good to see you. No, no. Where, where should we be for the question? Uh, maybe best if you stand up. Okay. Can you stand up for that? <laughs> 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 Hi. My name is Henning Mundell, and my question is to you. Okay. Um, I think your very last question was sort of a question mark, what if the UCP is elected? Um, you had a few graphs, though, which showed outflows in immigration. Unfortunately, it went a little fast for me to see what happened between 2015 and 2019 when the NDP was in government. So my question is, how was it then? Was there an uptick in immigration in or out? Oh, um, it was mainly out migration in that period, but you have to realize that, again, this, there's, there's so many confounding factors and then the economy wasn't doing that well, the price of oil in particular, until recently. So that's what's going on there. And then, again, that's why a lot of what I'm saying is a bit of speculation, just trying to, trying to figure out what we might see with current, because of current attitudes towards the government. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be like a lot of economists and say this will happen, you know, I mean, with 100% with certainty. I'm not sure. I really don't know. I could be wrong. But this is, this is what I see when I look at the data, look at the uh, responses of young people to what's going on in the province. So I'm hoping it doesn't happen. I mean, I'm an Albertan, right? And I, you know, I don't want to leave either. I'm not young either. So. <laughs> Good. It's a relative term. <laughs> well, every time I. Go ahead. Every time I do these, I sort of the generation that's there and me get closer together. So <laughs> I, I might just be buying one of those memberships. Thanks for the comment. Yeah, my name is Con Councillor John Middleton Hope. I'm with City Council. Mr. Belanger, thank you for the presentation today. I and members of City Council have invited you on several occasions to present some of your observations and solutions to a, sub a standing policy committee. We have yet to hear from you, and I encourage you to take yet another opportunity to be part of the solution. 
Ms. Bonnie Hilford, our City Clerk, is more than capable of setting up a presentation time convenient to you. Our next Community Safety SPC is May 11th at 1.30. I look forward to seeing you there. What's the question? It's no question, it's a statement heading. I heard that. <laughs> Well, it's, it, 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 it's a rather disingenuous statement, to be honest with you. I have never been approached formally to speak before that committee. Now I have, and I'm more than willing to. But please, let's play with the facts. Thank you. Can I ask a real quick throwaway question yeah, before my name. real, my name is Maureen Hawkins um, and I'm a retiring professor at University of Lethbridge. Um, okay, quick throwaway question. Does anybody know what Kenny's GPA was when he dropped out of university? <laughs> <laughs> the fact that he dropped out of university leads me to believe it was pretty low. But I think he left for other reasons, didn't he? Doesn't he have some, I mean, the, the, the Catholic school he was at was too conservative for him. <laughs> or not conservative enough, sorry. I, I think that was it. Well, I knew that was it, but I've always wondered if it was a cover that for, for failing out, <laughs> given how much he seems yeah. to hate post secondary education. Yeah, well, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research on post-secondary education. If you ask students the reasons for doing something, taking courses or what have you, a lot of times it's they're a little inaccurate, shall we say. So he might have flunked out, but basically in, in this example, but claimed that he was, you know, didn't ideologically different than the administration or whatever he did. So that's quite possible. Okay, my real question. <laughs> uh, Richard, this is for you. I, I wish I could ask a dozen questions because your, your presentation was, both, both presentations were fascinating. But my pre um, what do the cuts, UCP cuts to uh, post-secondary education have to do with our university students going elsewhere for education? And how does it combine and what is the effect of the anti-humanities propaganda that has been going on for so long? Um, I'm in the English department. When I came to U of L 30 years ago, my department had 14 full-time people. Now with two term appointments, we have about six. And we've got more students. Um, what is happening with humanities and the future, and how is this affecting immigration and out migration for Albertans? Okay, that's a lot to unpack there. Um, there's a lot going on in terms, I mean, <coughs> we're not, thank you, is that the best we do? Thank you. We're not providing enough spots for our own young people, especially in some of these competitive programs, right? So I've heard all these sort of anecdotes about, you know, nursing programs. I mean, the, the GPA requirement being like 99% to get in, you know, from high school is, <laughs> you know, how many kids have 99% to get in? So a lot of these students seem to be going outside the province to institutions they consider, at least this is a speculation that they consider equally as prestigious and get their degrees there. And of course, given the wealth in the province, a lot of parents can afford to do that, right? Now, there's a good chance they'll stay where they are. I mean, if you go to, you know, UBC or something to do a nursing degree, well, you know, the BC nurses are going to be recruiting at UBC. They're not going to be recruiting here, right? And Or maybe, you know, Alberta nurses aren't going to be recruited, uh, so people aren't coming back, um, or possibly. In terms of the humanities, yeah, I think, I think this is something that's going to play out over a number of years. We've, you know, we do this all the time. We, we see this in all the education stuff. I mean, you know, the STEM in particular is, you know, uh, is being promoted to, to the detriment of the humanities. And I don't think people realize until it's maybe too late how important the humanities are, you know. And this is a constant uh, complaint that uh, employers have about uh, students coming out of universities, their inability to, you know, they just don't still have the skills that a lot of what the humanities teach, which, you know, good writing, reasoning skills, and, you know, um, critical thinking, all that type of thing. But I think the student demographic, this is just me with my boots on the ground right now, the demographic has changed, and students, I mean, maybe they've been buying into that thing that you're not worth 
much unless you can get a STEM degree or something like that. And I don't think that's true. Um, we've done a lot of research in the past, mainly from Ontario, but we looked at humanities majors over time and, and how they do. I mean, a lot of the surveys that come out, this is the long answer, I hope that's okay. Um, the, um, a lot of the surveys that come out, as one of the main ones is called the National Graduate Survey, or a lot of the ones are even shorter. The National Graduate Survey looks at, grad at students when they graduate from universities, colleges, graduate schools, what have you, three years after graduation. Some other surveys are one year after graduation. And this is, yeah, quite frankly, this is where you find the English majors that are baristas. That doesn't mean they're going to be a barista forever, or that there's anything wrong with being a barista, really. Um, but you know, and you, so, so you see them basically gain their footing a little bit later in the labor market after three years, after after one year, after three years. So if you look out ten years, they do okay. And if you look at a lot of the CEOs of corporations and stuff, hey, these people have a good chance they have an MBA, but their first degree was history or English or philosophy, perhaps. So it's yeah, we're really undervaluing the humanities. Yeah. Yeah. Something to say? Hey, no. Oh, nothing. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> Ask him a question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's come here. <laughs> yeah. So my name is Mark Gettle. Now, a lot of the immigration, of course, is refugees. And more recently, the, um, <clears throat> the Ukrainian displaced people. They're not quite refugees. Yes. And they're basically coming here under limbo that they're expected to be here maybe for two years, and they're going to be going back. And uh, I'm sure a lot of them will not want to go back. So I'm just wondering <clears throat> what proportion of these immigrants and this influx of, of uh, immigrants are actually refugees and, and uh, displaced Ukrainians. And what do you think will happen once the war is over? Uh, will the federal government change their rules and let them become landed immigrants? Because right now they're not land landed immigrants, I believe, whereas the refugees are allowed to become or are, are even given landed immigrant status, I think, very, very shortly. So w what is what is the effect of all these uh, refugees and uh, and displaced Ukrainians on the, our immigration? And what do you think will happen in in the future with these people? Good, good question. Um, I don't really look at that here in particular. Mine's some inter interprovincial migration, but still, this this still feeds into that. So there's certainly a lot of Ukrainians uh, coming. There's going to be at least historically, once you allow a population to migrate, there is great pressure for them to remain, regardless if they're legally eligible or not. I think about temporary foreign worker programs in Europe, for example. Uh, so I suspect a lot of them will want to stay, and they're coming with their children and putting down roots. And you know, who knows how long the hostilities are going to be occurring over in that part of the world? I really don't know. Uh, in ter there's other issues too. What, what the influx of Ukrainians has done, in my understanding, is it's really put a lot of other uh, re uh, immigrants on hold, their, their, um, their, their paperwork on hold. They still want to sort of keep the cap at a certain amount, and they want the humanitarian to be part of that, which is what the, uh, the Ukrainians are, but they don't want to sort of exceed their, their target. So a lot of other people are being displaced, and paper, perhaps paperwork's being held up, et cetera, so they can expedite the Ukrainians coming in. Uh, we're probably getting more than our share in, I don't know, but I suspect we're getting more than our fair share in Alberta, given the history of, you know? So yeah, that's gonna, we'll see how that plays out. I really don't have a strong opinion or answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> Bev Mundell-Atherstone, thank you so much, Richard and Yale. That was uh, <coughs> some deep stuff for us to think about. <coughs> I'm quite curious about the Take Back Alberta movement within the UCP, and I'd like to know, uh, this is a question for you, Yale, because Richard's had a couple. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to know, in regard to your presentation, what is the intersectionality between Take Back Alberta and their their philosophy and their what they're going to be putting forth and what you have just explained uh, coming from the Jason Kenney and now into uh, Daniel Smith's uh, view of, of where things should go. Here we go. I, I think we just need to look at um, what Scott Moe in Saskatchewan has attempted to accomplish with his legislation and the Sovereignty Act that he's implemented. Um, there's a very clear sense of trying to create a Saskatchewan identity, and that Saskatchewan identity is one of settlers coming to the territory and establishing what we have today. Um, in doing so, there's a denial of Indigenous rights, of Aboriginal self-government, self-determination, of uh, there being partners in Confederation and helping to create that very environment. Um, in establishing what is his Sovereignty Act, he's alienated most First Nations leaders and Métis leaders in the province. Um, and those are not bridges that are going to be easy to rebuild at a later date. 
we're in the throes of going down that pathway with Take Back Alberta at this stage. It's about creating an Alberta identity and it's about establishing a sense of what we would call hegemony and power of decision making internal to a group of individuals that while it presents itself as very authoritative um, is very fearful of change and is very fearful of the other and so if we keep going down that pathway uh, it'll continue to be fragmented it'll become more divisive and a lot of the really important bridges that had been established with previous conservative governments uh, and Stelmac in particular and especially with Rachel Notley and the NDP which were essentially burned in many ways by the Jason Kenney government. Um, it's a fool me once, fool me twice moment. Uh, they aren't as willing to come back to the table. And with all of the issues that I alluded to, there's an incredible level of, I guess, control that indigenous peoples have over uh, resource development and so on, the, the very heart of who we are in many ways from an Alberta political perspective. Uh, they could ultimately start to uh, not veto so much, but really start to halt that production. So the impact could be incredibly detrimental and um, I don't know if creating a sense of identity amongst a very fringe minority of individuals who want to govern uh, at the expense of fragmenting who we are as a community is really worth it. Here comes trouble. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, Dr. Mueller said, here comes trouble. My name is Jim Byrne, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, uh, actually, I want to congratulate my colleague Gail, a uh, friend and colleague Gail, for another wonderful achievement getting blocked by Danielle Smith on Twitter recently <laughs> for asking those hard questions. Um, a a two-part question, so the part for each of you. Uh, I think Alberta's facing some dramatic migrations, uh, similar to what we saw you know, uh, about seven or eight years ago. Uh, oil sands are not going to last as long as they think, in my perspective. And many of you know I'm a climate scientist, uh, and, and it's scary. So I think we're, we're facing probably our biggest migration outwards, probably beginning by 2030, if not before. Fort McMurray is already stressed, um, you know, in terms of its, its uh, certainly its economy is not booming anywhere near, near it did. So I expect there's going to be a, an out migration, and that's going to affect. Fort McMurray dramatically, and Calgary and Edmonton very substantially. We're down here in this sunny, warm south, so wind, solar, those types of things. Um, the other part of the question is, is Yale, could you comment? Um, I think indigenous rights, indigenous actions may move the oil sands out even more quickly because they're now planning to take the, the moving forward with plans that they call them environmental plans, they are not, um, you know, wanting to start they no longer have room for tailings, so they want to put treated tailings into the Athabasca River. And I think indigenous populations are going to rise up against this. And it's probably the time is right for that to happen. So, you know, your, your advice, thoughts, much appreciated from both of you. Okay. I also wanted to announce that the Lethbridge Herald blocked me as well. So <laughs> I don't know how you're going to write this one up, my friend. <laughs> um, it's a complex situation when we get into the north of Edmonton um, geographic zone because we have a number of First Nations and Métis communities that are pro-development, as is their self-determining right. Uh, they're clashing with a number of Métis and First Nations communities that are advocating, uh, I guess, greener pathways. And what we found under the, the, the Kenya regime especially, and it's continuing on with Danielle Smith, is there, from a political perspective, we're now privileging the pro-development uh, faction that's in the north. Now, all of a sudden we've got the federal government saying that the inherent right to self-government exists, which means that the pro-development communities can do as they see fit within their territory. They can establish relationships with uh, private public industry. Um, at the same time, those who are anti oil development, also have the self-determining right to push back. So what's happening is there's a lot of contention and antagonisms developing from, I guess, an inter-Indigenous perspective that the government is simply watching play out while at the same time subtly funding and promoting and advocating on behalf of the pro-development groups. Um, I've had a chance to talk with many folks who live up in the north and that's really become a wedge issue in terms of uh, dividing the communities and it's playing out in such a way that those antagonisms could lead to I, I, very uh, hard feelings that are going to last for a long period of time. So the idea that perhaps there is pushback occurring amongst indigenous populations in the north against oil production 
there are some communities that are doing that, but the bulk of those that are pro-development that are allied with the Alberta government right now, um, they've actually, they're, they're holding the power and you're not gonna see as much pushback uh, occurring in that, in that context. Oh, in terms of the relationship, I think your question was about the relationship between the oil sands and migration, basically. This sort of free-for-all, okay? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think my understanding, you better than I do about this stuff, of course, is that the oil sands have come, come from an uh, uh, exploration phase and a, and a uh, development phase to a production phase. And so they simply don't need the number of people they used to uh, up there. And I think that if I took a deeper dive into the data, I'd probably find those numbers if I, if I could. I think that the Alberta economy, and there's another project I'm involved with tangentially that's taken looking at this, looking at the diversification of the labor market. And if you look at what we're trying to attract right now with all the job vacancies in Alberta, it's a pretty diverse kind of crowd. And, uh, you know, I, Alberta eventually, I mean, all the things I say could be true. I mean, we could have an exodus of, of young people. It's not going to be... It'll be problematic for the province, but it won't be catastrophic, I don't think, necessarily. It's a shame and all that stuff. Um, but um, we're not going to be a ghost town. I mean, there will be ghost towns within Alberta, I suspect, but it's not going to be a ghost town. And again, I think it's because we become increasingly diversified and we can weather this, this storm. So um, I'm all with you on the oil sands and, and a lot of the stuff you were saying about it, but yeah, I'm not uh, worried about this max exodus by any means. So. Okay, hold on. There we go. <laughs> Hi, Barb Phillips. Thank you for that impactful, whole, a whole lot of stuff to unpack there, but thank you. Um, my question as a lifelong Canadian and Albertan and only 10 years in Lethbridge, I'm really concerned about this increasing polarization because I feel I can be a proud Canadian, proud Albertan and proud Lethbridge citizen doing the best for each of those uh, institutions. However, we seem to have one government pitting against the other. We always have to be kind of at war with the feds, it appears of late. And uh, my question is, how as a voter and a lifelong Albertan who once voted for Joe Clark, I had the honor of living in his constituency. So you know what, I've been lots of things in this world and I've seen a lot in Alberta and Canada, but I'm not very pleased with this division that we are, we are undergoing that um, municipally we say, well, that's the provincial department where nothing to do with us. The province says, well, blame the feds if all else fails, what, what can we as Canadians, Albertans and Lethbridge residents do about this polarization other than vote on May 29th, I guess? I don't think there's a right answer to this one or even, even a answer that would be uh, appreciated by most people. Um, I don't really, I guess, yeah, we just get out and vote. And I, I think the thing, I mean, what really, st I still don't understand this myself, how Albertans can be so similar when it comes to the rest of the country and so many metrics by, you know, measuring so many different things. And yet we still always vote these weird governments <laughs> into power, to be polite, I suppose. I think there's just something to do with this. I mean, a lot of it dates back. Well, you, you want to come talk about this? He's the guy to talk to. You can talk to him later about it. Um, I think a lot of it has to d just deal with, you're talking about this originalism and all that. I, I think it has a lot to do with our history and, and our relationship with the government, especially since Pierre Trudeau's times in the National Energy Program. And I think people here just have a visceral reaction that any, I mean, you know, NDP are a bunch of socialists, even though that's not true. I mean, I, I would argue I know, that they're, you know, further to the the right than, than Lougheed was, you know, in a lot of ways, basically. Uh, and But I think it's just this gut reaction that Alberta's ha have, and I think, is, aren't the districts still kind of gerrymandered in a big way in Alberta? Yeah. So the, the rural population in Alberta still has a larger uh, proportion of the vote than they should have, right? And that's a big thing. You go to rural Alberta and you talk to people and whoa, it's like a different world out there sometimes. So I don't know, I guess we can just vote. I think we I get get the message out there that we're not a bunch of, you know, conservative uh, ideologues uh, like the rest of the country believes, and that's going to help with immigration. That's going to help with electing the appropriate people. Uh, get young people voting. They have a lot of vested interest in a lot of this, and they don't vote, and that's something I encourage my students to do. And I think they, didn't they have polling stations on campus even the last time around? I think they did, didn't they? Yeah, which was an attempt to get students. So all those things kind of, from a non-political science perspective, that's, you know, that's that's what I think, so thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs>
You got nothing? Yeah, I'll try it. Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna Very quickly, it. I'll give her a shot. <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to Maureen. Uh, she was an instructor of mine back in the day, and she gave me my only F plus. <laughs> so. <laughs> So you can blame you can blame her for this, all right? Um, Not what you ended up with. No, <laughs> good, good memory, good memory. Um, a lot of it's institutionalized now. I use that language a lot, but when we embed difference within the Constitution, within our laws, within our policies, um, it, it's a it's a natural reaction in many ways to simply keep going down those pathways. Um, we see with the housing debate and the homelessness debate here in town. Um, where the, you know, Councillor Dodik has made it very clear that uh, we should stay in our own lane, we should stay in our own pathway, and not really venture outside of there. I also think there's a deliberation issue at play. It's not just about voting, it's about having interaction with our elected officials in between. And Jason Kenney made it very clear that once he was in power, there was gonna be more, no more dialogue. You've got four years to basically gauge our performance, and then that's it, you can vote us in or you can vote us out. And the idea of deliberation, well, it was brought up at the start with a statement, you know, come and speak to the, the committee. Um, what I find is that politicians these days, they don't recognize or they fail to recognize that they work for us, right? I don't work for them. We don't work for them. There should be, yeah, there he goes. So there should be a dialogue. There should be a recognition and a reciprocity at play. And I don't think that within those elite communities as they've evolved, which can push us away and not have to talk to us, those issues have become very real at this point. So it's not incumbent upon us as voters, it's incumbent upon us as individuals to now interact in a much more cordial and effective way and recognize that Canada is a community, the province is a community, Lethbridge is a community. We all intersect, we all interact, and at one point or another, if we just stay in our lane, we're just traveling next to one another and we're not getting anything accomplished. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Jill and Richard. Uh, can you weave in my question into your final thoughts? Uh, my question relates to the funding that the provincial government have uh, decided to give back to the university in the form of uh, targeted courses. So if you can give us your, something to take home with and answer that question at the same time. We're running all time, so if you can do that, that'd be perfect. Yeah, thanks, good question. I, I love these kind of questions, because basically the governments are not good at picking winners. You know, and so, I mean, a good example of this is if you, if you would have told somebody that uh, petroleum engineering was a good discipline back in 2013, they would have, yeah, right on, it's a great profession to be in. Come 2014, not so much. And so it's just, and then it's again, it relates back to Maureen's question about the humanities and things. What we try to teach at universities a lot of times, or what we think at universities is important, is that we're not educating people t towards specific career goals, we're educating them, we're teaching them to teach themselves, basically, as lifelong learners. And so you have to you know, learn to teach yourself uh, things a lot and along your career, and that's what employers are also going to value, and that's what comes with something like a humanities uh, program. If you do something you know, more technical, let's say, learn the latest computer code and language, that's great, you're probably gonna get a job, but maybe if you can't upgrade those skills throughout your career, you're gonna be not, uh, it's not gonna be beneficial to you, so. Um, yeah, I hope that, yeah, government shouldn't be picking these things. They, it's okay to target sort of specific things, that's okay, a lot of times uh, that's necessary, but they obviously have, started to refund certain programs to the detriment of others, and I think that's a problem, and we're gonna see that down the road. 